So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Miguel Angel Jordan. Miguel was going to come to a conference that we had planned in Canberra called International Jane Austen. I thought he would be a wonderful person to come and speak. He uh, is a member of the Jane Austen Society in Spain, and he came very highly recommended as a speaker. But of course, this dreadful thing called COVID got in the way. And sadly, we had to cancel the conference and Miguel's visit. So I thought, well, at least one way we can get to meet him and hear about his writing about Jane Austen was to have him as our international Zoom lecturer for this year. So Miguel grew up in Cartagena, and then he traveled to Valencia to study English and philology. And he began to work as a language teacher in secondary schools. And then he did a PhD on the writing of Jane Austen. He has written a delightful novel called Jane about Jane Austen's life. I think Miguel has done a really lovely job of combining letters, extracts from the novels, what we know about the life of Jane Austen in what is, I found, a very moving novel. So it gives me great pleasure today to welcome the Vice President of the Jane Austen Society of Spain, Miguel Angel Jordan. So over to you. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you for having me. So, well, uh, I was supposed to be there a few years ago. I really wanted to go to Sydney. I was so excited. I even had the plane ticket. I had everything ready, but then COVID arrived and all in our lives changed. But at least uh, I have this opportunity. So I'm really, really, really glad um, and honored to be here. So I think that the, the title of the talk was uh, how I can often change my life because this is something that I usually explain when I go to different places is that actually can often change my life because I want to explain now I will explain everything little by little I was living in Valencia was a secondary school teaching I love reading and once before summer I'm not really sure what year it was I went to a a library looking for a book for a novel for the summer and i found a book called emma i didn't know well i i had heard of the author in austin but i hadn't read anything by her uh, so far so but i remember that a friend of mine had, had told me that he had seen a movie called emma and he told me i think that you would like it uh when i so the, the novel, the cover of the novel was the cover of, of the movie or with a uh, Whitney pattern uh, with the picture. So I decided to read the book. I remember that from the very beginning, I was surprised uh, and I was delighted. I really loved the, the style of this author. Uh, I found her so fun, so entertaining, and also that she was so well written. So I really loved the story. And when I finished the book, I looked for a different one, and I read Sense and Sensibility, and then I read Pride and Prejudice, and I completely fell in love with the master because I really loved the, the, the way he, he wrote. So I was a reader of the Austen, and everything was okay. I mean, I didn't have lots of people to talk about her, because my friends, well, they didn't know her. Actually, when I told her of the books, they usually told me, okay, these, these are books for ladies. And I was like, no, these are, good. these are books for everyone. They're amazing books. So the time went by. Um, well, what happened? That I was working, as I told you, as a teacher, but then I began writing books. At the beginning, it was young adult fiction, and I published several novels. So I started also working as a writer going to different schools, to presentations and different talks in different places. And after publishing, I think it was eight novels, I decided that I wanted to change a little the register. I wanted to do something different. So this is like how everything begins. So once upon a time, there was a writer, it was me, looking for a story. I wanted to write something different. But I wasn't sure of what story I wanted to tell because I had told all the stories I wanted to 
I, I had in mind. And I remember that a friend of mine told me, why don't you write a historical novel? Because the story is already there. You only have to do, you only have to do some research, and then you have to design how you're going to tell the story and all that. But the story is already there. So I decided to think about it. But the question was, okay, if I'm going to spend a lot of time doing some research about different things, it should be about someone that I'm really interested about. And then it's when the idea of Jen Austen came to my mind because I had read her novels probably twice, uh, each one of them, and I was uh, interested in the character of the author. I wanted to know more about her. So I decided, okay, why not doing some research about this lady and then writing her biography in the form of a novel? Because if I am a reader, I love her novels, but I don't know almost anything about her. So probably her life is not really well known. And I think that this lady is that deserves to be known. So that was the idea. But then I thought about it and some dangers and risks appeared. I thought, okay, challenge it, right? Her life was very like a regular one. I did a very light research. So I saw that she had died very young, that her life was very normal life. And then I thought, okay, lots of people love this author. So if I write a novel, the result is not as good as I expected. They are going to hate me, right? And then also, if I want to go inside the character, I have to get to know this person really well. And probably I'm not able to do that. So I don't know if I will be able to get the right tone to talk like her, to go into her feelings, into her thoughts. So it was a big challenge, right? Then I said, okay, let's try. Okay, let's try. What's the aim? What do, what do I want to do with this novel? So I, I want to first to get to know her through her works and through the biographies and the letters. And then I'm going to try to show to the rest of the people, to the readers, how she was in an entertaining way, but trying to be really faithful to the historical facts. So, so the first steps, this was before I started to, to, to write. So it was, and also because actually, before I started to plan about the novel, it was, okay, what should I do if I want to do this? So I thought, okay, I need to read everything on her, all the biographies, even those which are not really accurate. I need to know everything that has been said about her to get a global perspective. Also because now I teach history, but at the, at the time I like history, but I don't really have a historical mind. I, I, I know some people who are able to, to retain in their minds dates, names, they have a global perspective. My mind works in a different way, so I need to go through things a lot of times if I want to have a global perspective. So I needed to read a lot. This way, I would have her whole life in my head, and this way I could be able to restructure everything. Because I wanted to tell the story in a way that would be entertaining, not just chronological order. I wanted to go uh, forward, backwards. I wanted to highlight the main facts. So then I needed to know the places, okay? Because, well, she didn't travel a lot. Her life happened mostly in the south of England. So that was not a big problem, but I was very familiar with these places. So I needed to get to know them a little. And then all the names, because when I read the letters, I found hundreds of names. Lots of them of the family, because as you know, she had lots of nieces and nephews and then brothers, sisters, then lots of people uh, that are mentioned on the let's say, okay, I need to, to have like a name, map, dates, lots of dates, and as I told you, I'm not really good with dates. So I will have to create like the skeleton, all the things I'm going to tell, okay, all the story I want to put forward, all the facts, all the people, and how I'm going to organize it so it will be easy for the people to understand everything. As I told you, reading everything, also the blogs, uh, web pages, all the things to see all the documentaries, films, adaptations, biopics. So I knew it would be like a long time before I could start uh, writing. 
I needed to really get familiar to everything, not just the biography, but also all the things that different people have said about her. Like, I don't know, probably you have read about this. There were different ideas about how Jan Austen died, uh, actually, if she was poisoned by Cassandra accidentally, or this kind of thing. Like, I, I need to get to know all of this, so I will address all these topics uh, curiously. Yeah, trying to visualize the sceneries because I've been to England, to London, uh, different places, but I haven't been to Bath or anywhere, right? So all these places, Stevenson, Shelton, I need to, to have these places in mind. Thankfully, now we have so many means that it was easy uh, with the help of Google Earth or lots of pay web pages, videos, so I could be there although I haven't ever visited it. And then the letters, because that was a, an easy way to go into her mind, into her biography. So that was another idea. So this was like the previous steps I had to take in order to be able to write the, uh, the biography. So when I was thinking all of this, then the big, the big question came to my mind, which was what happens if after all this time, all this effort, I don't see myself writing this novel because it could happen that I don't find that there is a story to tell or that I don't feel I'm able to write this story. So what will happen if I spend, I don't know, one, two years working on this and, and then I'm not able to write the book? It will be wasted time, right? Uh, I would have learned a lot about her, but in the end, I couldn't write anything. So, for a big question, you need a big answer. So, I decided, okay, I'm going to do a PhD on Jen Austen. Because I had the idea that they wanted to do a PhD, and probably on Jen Austen, because I love literature. I wanted to, to do some research on someone, to become an expert on someone. So, I said, why not Jen Austen? But this time, it was like the, the perfect uh, excuse to do that. So I said, okay, I'm going to do the PhD on Jen Austen. So that way, uh, at the end of this research, at least I will have a PhD. So I will be Dr. Jordan, which sounds great. Okay, so like, okay, I can do that. But so then I decided, okay, what do I have to do? First, I need a master. Because in Spain, if you want to do your PhD, first you need to be a master's, a master program on something, and then you can go through the PhD process. So this was 2014 when I first did a master's on translation because that was one of the, the things I could do for the schedules and because it was in my university and all these things. And then on the following year, I did a thesis about the literary style of Jen Austen. I'm going to stop here a little because this changed my life. This was at the moment that really changed my life because for doing this thesis, we, we were almost in the bicentenary of Jen Austen's death. So there were lots of conferences on different things on Jen Austen. So I went to a conference about Jen Austen in Madrid. It was the first time I was uh, attending a conference on Jen Austen. So when I arrived there, I met a lot of people who were experts on Jen Austen. And for me, that really was uh, fascinating because for the first time in my life, I met with lots of people who had read all the books, who knew more about Jen Austen than me, because when I tried to talk, as I told you, with my friends about the books, they didn't care, they hadn't read it. But there, I remember during a lunch, we were talking about all the characters. So for me, we were like, I don't know, like a Star Wars fan who goes to a Star Wars convention, you know, and you find all these people. So it's like, wow, amazing. So I'm there in one of the breaks. I met a young lady and we were talking about the books. And then she told me, uh, you know, I am thinking about creating the Genostian Society in Spain because there isn't one so, so far. And I told her, all right, it sounds great. So if you're going to do that, count on me. And she told me, all right. So I really appreciate that because I need some help. So and she told me, all right, so I will be the president and you will be the vice president. So that's how I became the vice president of the Genocide Society. So at the beginning, it was nothing. That was 2016. But the moment, well, 
Luckily, her father is a lawyer, so he really helped us with all the paperwork. The moment we created some social media and we started talking about this, we had a huge response. So hundreds, hundreds of people in Spain and then thousands were interested in Chenosten. And also we were in touch with people from South America, from all the Spanish speaking countries. Some of them were in the conference. There were people from Mexico, people from Argentina. So we started to be in touch. And then after a few months getting ready for that, we had our first event, which was at the University of Valencia, where I live and where I was doing my PhD. So we had a study day on Jane Austen. It was like the first experience. Some researchers from my university and also some invited, some guest speakers. More than 100 people attended the conference. Most of them, or some of them, students from the university, because there were lots of them who had read books of Jane Austen and they were interested in that. It was a huge success. So we were really, really happy. And we saw that we had uh, all these people interested. So we started doing more activities. Some of them face-to-face in different universities and some of them online, because that way we could have more people attending them. So we had study days in universities like uh, Valencia, I told you, then in Madrid, in Autonoma, then in Salamanca, which is the oldest university in Spain and one of the oldest in the world. Then in other places, we had some presentations in different, for example, in Barcelona, they invited us to La Casa del Libro, which is a very famous bookshop. They have different conferences. So we had a presentation on Jen Austin, uh, Elena and I, where they are talking. And then we went to different places in Andalusia talking about this. We organized some uh, online book clubs about different books. We were preparing what would be like our big event. Uh, the title was Jen Austin and the Arts. And the idea was to talk about Jen Austin from different perspectives, from the music, fashion, painting, all these things. So we had different guest speakers. One, some of them were writers who have written books about Jen Austen. We had some, some women who are tailors, so they were to do like a fashion show with different gowns and dresses of the Jen Austen's era. And then we also had some artists that uh, have illustrated different books of Jen Austen. So we had all these people, but then again, COVID arrived, so we couldn't do anything. We had to cancel. We want to do it, but probably we will do this next year because we are still in touch. And we had more than 300 uh, attendants that had confirmed that we will be there. So it was so bad, but likely or hopefully we will do it in a few in a few months, probably next year. So then I began with the Genocide Society, as I told you, but the problem is still was there, right? Like the book, I wanted to write a book. So thanks to my PhD, well, I had to, to reread all her books. So I learned about her, her novels. I had to read, to read uh, lots of works, lots of research about her novels. So since my thesis is about her literary style, what actually what I did was to read all the novels. Well, I divided, uh, well, this is like the classical division. When you talk about a novel, we have what we what is told and the way it is told, so the, the story and the visual. So in the story, you have four elements, which are, well, the, the characters, the narrator, uh, the plot, um, like the scenery, the, the settings. And then in the discourse, you have the four elements, which are the dialogues, the voice of the narrator, the descriptions, and the thoughts. So using this four and four element, I analyzed the, the six novels of Jane Austen, I didn't talk about uh, Lady Susan or the incomplete ones. So analyzing how Jane Austen, for example, creates dialogues in all of them, and then how the narrator speaks all in all of them. So it's a 500 pages thesis in Spanish. So if you want to read it, it's available in, in, on the internet. But uh, it's kind of a tough reading. So, but I really learned a lot when I was doing that. So now 
I'm ready, okay? I'm ready to, to write the novel. So after doing the, the, the master's, after doing the PhD, after doing all this work, I decided to start writing. But then I realized that not yet. I still have to wait a little. Because by studying Jane Austen, I had learned not only about the literary style, but also about how to create, how to write a novel. So I decided to apply some of the knowledge I had acquired during this time. So when studying Jane Austen, I realized that there are different layers of her novels, and there is a huge plan behind the novel. She really knows how she wants to manage the story, when to do things, how she's going to tell they kind of mm, tell you some details that will become really important a uh, hundred pages later. So she really has everything in her mind. So I decided to do something, right? So it was well, okay. Some strategies to show Jan Austen because I wanted to create a real character. I wanted people to get to know her in the same way that we get to know the character in Jan Austen's novels because, as you know, we don't usually find long descriptions of the characters we find like some information here and there, and then we get to know the people through everyday situations, through the way they speak. So I decided to use everyday situations in Jane Austen's life, then to do some flashbacks in order to show some aspects of her childhood, because at the beginning I thought, okay, I, I could start the novel talking about her when she was a child, but in one of the letters of Jane Austen, when she's giving some advice to her name, Fanny, about how to write a book, she said that no one is interested in, in young ladies until they are grown up. Meaning, no one is interested in, in children. Children are not really interested in books. So I said, okay, let's do something. I will talk about Jane Austen when she's grown up, but then I will do some flashbacks to show some aspects of her childhood when she was in the boarding school, and then also, I decided to use the letters as a guideline because, you know, on the one hand, they help us to listen to her voice uh, because they are their real letters. She wrote them. So if I introduce the letters in the book, you can read Jenna's first hand. And then it will increase the realism because you will see that if you read the novel, some of the chapters, uh, they begin with a quote from one of the letters and then you connect with the real life, with the action. So it's like, in the end, what I did was like filling the gaps between the letters, showing you what's going on when she's writing that, and showing you, well, and also I introduced a fictional diary in order to show her thoughts and her feelings. So that's not real. That's one of the few not real things that I introduced in the, in the book, because all the important facts that appear in the book are historical facts. Then, what I decided to do Obviously, some time leaps because although Jane Austen's life was very short, she died when she was 41. I wanted to focus especially in the, the moment, in the time when she was writing and publishing the books. So these are more like strategies to keep the attention of the readers. There are, there are so many characters, so many important people in Jane Austen's life that I decided uh, she will be the main character, obviously. But then I want to talk about her brothers. Uh, her sister Cassandra and uh, her parents and uh, her friends so we have to talk about some different people and to give them some to, to change the focus from time to time and then lots of people died lots of uh, sister-in-law died so like if someone is going to die I want people to feel sorry for her so I need to bring this character forward so when I start talking about someone a lot probably it means that this person is going to die, right? Because there were a lot of casualties in her real life. Then I try to show the character's evolution in the same way as she does in her novels. Then I thought, okay, should I try to imitate her style? And I, the answer was no, because I wouldn't be able to do that, right? But only in a few things. So probably she likes to use these three word series, for example, the adjectives or three nouns or three adverbs in order to emphasize something. So I decided to do that. So probably you will find this uh, in the novel because it's a very good way to emphasize something. They came into a room which was too hot 
too crowded and too, I don't know, too small. This way you create a sensation with just three small surfaces. And then in order to be able to find the places, I had this timeline combining the historical facts, the story I wanted to tell and how I wanted to organize it. So when I was working with this, on the top of, of my table, a big table, I had lots of papers because I needed to check lots of things when I was writing. Then the timeline and then the family tree, you know, her family, as I told you, lots of nieces and nephews, some of them with the same name. So it was not easy to keep in mind who we, we, uh, we were talking about. And then there is uh, an edition of Jane Austen's letters in Spanish. And it's a very good edition, and there are a lot of annexes with lists of names, with timelines. So this also was really, really helpful in order to, to get ready. So with this, I started to write. And at the beginning, I was really, really unconfident because I needed to check so many things in order to write just a page that it was quite hard. But then, little by little, I started to feel more secure. So at the beginning, I didn't want to overwhelm the readers with lots of information. So I tried to provide information gradually. At the beginning, there are only a few characters, Jane Austen family, her brother Henry, her niece Anna, her mother, to repeat the names once and again in order to help the readers to get familiar to the names. So go to a slow pace at the beginning, and then little by little to focus on the characters. Right at the beginning, the facts, to know where we are, and then to, to focus on the characters, on their feelings, on their emotions, on their, on their interactions, and all of this. I started writing, and after just three, four months, I wrote the book. But in the process, when I was writing the book, the letters made more sense, because I remember the first time I read the letters, since I didn't know the context, I found them. Well, not really interesting because they are personal letters from Jane Austen to her sister, mainly, and then to some music. But then when I knew the context, I understood what she was talking about. And that was uh, quite enlightening and um, illuminating. So it was really helpful. And then, as I told you, the letter became a guideline. Then I had, when you start writing, you start having more doubts and more ideas. So I needed to learn, for example, the distances, because if I wanted to explain how she's going from one place to the other, I needed to know how long it, that would take by horse. So I used Google Maps to know, okay, if they're going to, from here to there, how many days, how many stops, all these things. Then about the publishing market, the 19th centuries, how much did it cost, how did it work, because I wanted to explain the process well, how the contact with the publisher, with the editor, all these things. And then I decided to introduce lots of Jane Austen's quotes from her letters and novels within the book, in the dialogues, in the thoughts. Because what I wanted uh, for the people, for the readers, what I wanted them to, to really hear Jane Austen's voice. So if you read the English edition, you will find literal quotes of Jane Austen here and there. In the Spanish edition, it's also there, but it's uh, more difficult to identify them because probably the translation is sometimes is not so accurate. But in English, actually, when we <coughs> translated the book into English, some translators did it, but they was in charge of highlighting the actual words of Jane Austen and translating that, looking for the original quote. And then I tried when uh, in the novel we arrive to the different moments in which she publishes one of the four books that were published while she was alive, I tried to show all the excitement, all the doubts, all the insecurity that usually uh, arises when you are going to publish a book. So since I had had the experience, then I tried to, to explain everything from Jane Austen's perspective. How, how you feel when you have the first copies, the first proofread, the versions, all this. We can enjoy her novels without having a knowledge about her biography. But I have no doubt that if you get to know her life, then you will appreciate her novels better. 
because we can find her in different places in the novel, in her liking for balls, for walks, in her relationship with her brothers, in, in her interest for the Navy, all this. So the timeline of the making of, of this book will be from September of 2014, the masters, then the thesis, then the first draft of the novel. Uh, then I waited to publish it with different publishers, but finally it was first published in 2018 in Spain. Then there was a second, uh, oh, sorry, in 2020, the English edition, and then a second edition in Spain. Here we are. So to sum it up, there is this quote from Persuasion, you know, this conversation between Mr. Elliot and Anne Elliot. Mr. Elliot says, Torrent says, my idea of good company is the company of clever, well-informed people who have a great deal of conversation. That is what I call good company. And then Mr. Elliot says, you are mistaken, that he gently, that is not good company. That is the best. So for me, this was an amazing journey with the best company, which was Jen Austen, and now with an amazing company, which are all Jen Austen's readers who have read the novel and that are writing to me, letting me know if they have liked it and how they have. Some people who actually hadn't read Jen Austen but read my novel, they decided to read all Jen Austen's novels or to reread Jen Austen's novels. So that was the, the aim of the book, to show Jen Austen's and to awake this interest in her life and in her book. So this is mainly what I wanted to tell you, all this information at the same time. Now, if you want to ask something. That was fascinating. Thank you so much, Miguel. I loved sharing your journey as to how Jane Austen has changed your life. There's no doubt mm -hmm. she's changed mine, so I could really relate to that. Uh, Miguel, I'm very interested in... Uh, students in Spain, uh, most of them reading the novels in translation in Spanish. You know, you talked about the wonderful number of people who came to your, your conference. Mm -hmm. Would most of them have read the novels in Spanish rather than in English? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I forgot to tell you yeah, that that's one of the, the results of studying in Austin. Since I did my PhD, uh, I was able to apply for a position in the University of Valencia. And then I started working at the university in Valencia. So I started working at the university thanks to Jen Austen. And now my students, they are from the degree of English studies. So their English is quite good and they are able to read Jen Austen in English. But most of the people in Spain uh, read translations. Translations into Spanish of Jen Austen's books are quite good. But the thing is, is it is very difficult to translate Jen Austen into a different language because she was so committed to find the right word. And she mastered the language so well that her sentences make all the sense in the way she wrote them. The moment you want to change something, everything is complicated. So for example, I remember doing some research, I found 32 different translations for the opening paragraph of Pride and Prejudice. 32 different translations into Spanish. Some of the expressions are so English, right? It's in needs of a wife, it's in want of a wife, that we don't have this expression in, in, in the Spanish. So it's like, this happens all the way when you want to translate genocide into, into Spanish. You need to explain, yeah, that's why, well, I, I have read translations and the original books, and it's like, yes, you need to read the books in English. But anyway, People that don't uh, understand English, don't, can't, don't read in English, they read the translations and they really love to understand. Thank you, Miguel. That's most interesting. And uh, just before we pass over to anyone else who wants to ask questions, one of the things I really loved about your book was the way in which you showed the death of her sister-in-law, Eliza. Now, obviously, we don't have information about Eliza's last moments on earth but I mm. felt the way you handled that was really beautiful I found it very moving so uh, just a personal thank you for that particular bit of your novel because uh, I, I really loved the way in which you handled Eliza's death that was beautifully done so thank you well thank you well one of the things that happened when you are writing a book is in the end you you care about the characters so I didn't know anything about Eliza a few years ago, but when I was doing some research and writing about her, I actually kind of fell in love with the character because she was so, I don't know, fascinating. Her life is 
fascinating. So I wanted to represent her in a special way. It's so sad that she died. And I think that Eliza was an important character in Jane Austen's life. So I wanted to represent that in a fictional way. But yeah, it was a, I, it was kind of a moving moment when I was writing that for me. It came through. Does anyone have questions they would like to ask Miguel? Yes, I'd like to ask you, Miguel, could we have a copy of your book in uh, Spanish here in Australia? Is it available? Well, yeah, it's in Spanish. It's available on Amazon, for example. So I don't know if, but if you buy it on Amazon, you can find the Spanish version. Because the Spanish version, you can find it everywhere in every library, every bookshop in Spain. But yeah, I think that digital platforms uh, also sell the uh, Spanish version. Yes. Any other questions people would like to ask? I can't wait to read the book. Uh, I'm just uh, blown away by how much research and study um, that Miguel was able to put together and still have a day job, I think. I just want to know, what are you working on next? Are you working on any other English authors or any other Spanish authors and writing a book about them? Yeah, well, um, now I'm working on Spanish authors because actually in the next weeks, I will have to, to give a course, uh, which will be entitled Reading with Writer's Eyes. And it's going to be a, like a mix of a writing workshop and a literature workshop. So the thing is, we will be studying some Spanish authors, and then we will be working how to create a novel. Uh, le learning from these authors, I don't know, for example, Miguel Delibes or uh, like recent uh, current authors. So mm -hmm. I'm doing some research on them. I also, I love uh, English and American literature. I haven't done so much research, but for example, I love obviously uh, the Bronte sisters or some American authors like Mark Twain, despite uh, his words of Jen Austen. Um, so yeah. Um, that's one of the things that when I read other English speaking authors, it's like no one is like Jane Austen. I mean, they are very, very good. But I haven't found anyone with the same style, with the same I don't know, elegance, and at the same time so entertaining. Because for me one of the merits of the Jane Austen book is yeah, that they are really good. They are profound, but they are entertaining, they are fun. You have a really good time. They you can read them so easily in in her years books were so long and some of them were so boring for example i read i love middlemarch and i think this is an amazing book but this i don't know 800 pages or 900 pages and like you don't really need so many pages to tell a story because in the end you are I don't know, you, you, you lose interest or there are so many characters you get lost or whatever so I think that one of the advantages, uh, one of the, I don't know, the, the, the merits of Jane Austen, he was able to create this fascinating novels in a time when novels were not so fascinating. So she's quite modern, I think. So learning about Jane Austen is kind of the thing that when you try to find another author, it's difficult to find someone like her. Although they are, they are really, really good authors, but it's like something unique. So, yeah. Thank you. Nobody liked Jane Austen. When you did the English version, did you translate your Spanish version or did you rewrite no, it in I another found, way? Uh, and nothing. what were the challenges there? Mm. Well, yes. So, uh, I was interested in having the English version because Jane Austen is English. So, I wanted people to read her actual words in English. So I found a translator, a British person, who was living in Valencia. So I presented the project to him, um, to him and to his wife, because both of them made the first version of the translation. So we were in touch. So I would overview the translation to explain, because they didn't know the context. So sometimes they asked me questions. Like, well, what's the sense of this sentence? So they did all the translation. I just proofread it. And then there were other hands in the translation. For example, I sent the book to an American researcher on Jane Austen. He 
do like the proofreading of the historical things, like this expression wouldn't appear in the years or this metaphor or this. And then finally, an American editor did the last proofreading. So I hope the translation is good because lots of people have intervened in that. But yes, I, I it was an amazing job. And yes, my, my mission was highlighting what was actual Jane Austen's work because that way that would be uh, kept the way it was. Although probably now it's not correct in current English, for example, in the letters, we, we keep the, the right words. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I was just interested in this um, difficulty between translating from English into Spanish. And I think probably there's, there's a work there that you should write about the difficult you know, going through all her novels and explaining which parts of it was difficult to translate from English into Spanish. I think that, you know, I noticed, I think I noticed that you did your master's in translation. And uh, yes. So, yes. so you would, um, you would have a lot of interesting, you know, the generally, I think it's a generally such an interesting topic of what's lost in translation, you, you know, to quote that famous story. Um mm -hmm. Not only with Spanish and English, but uh, but many other languages. You know uh -huh. the, the difficulty of translation and and what words are, you know, what words are in English that are impossible to translate into Spanish and so on. I think, I mean, there's so much about Jane Austen that you can talk about. It. Because the other thing that I've got interested in is the novels of Winston Graham, because his they've follow the same period, uh, basically, when Jane was writing. It, it, because Jane doesn't mention much about how the lower classes managed life in those days, whereas Winston Graham does go into that quite a lot, the poverty and the difficulties of younger, the, the, and the class distinctions between the, the rich and the poor and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's... Mm. that's Thing. Yes. Yes. Actually, I have read some um, some papers about Jane Austen's translation into Spanish because it's a really interesting topic. Actually, I when I did my master's, my master's thesis was about the translation and the adaptation of North uh, Northanger Abbey into Spanish, like the first adaptation of Northanger Abbey into a movie, and then the translation. And there are lots of, let's say, mistakes in the translation. For example, I remember there's a conversation in which Henry Chilney asked Catherine Moran, have you been to Paris? As I say, no, I only know about France where I have read or I have seen or I have seen in pictures. And this was translated in Spanish into photographs when photography hadn't haven't been invented in the year. So no I have not only know what I have seen in photographs. And so you can listen to that in the Spanish version, which is like Photographs, you know, like the 19th century, right? So small things, but usually the really concise sentences. We all know lots of Jane Austen's quotes, right, by heart, because it's like so easy to remember and so full of meaning. So many things in so many so in so few words that when you want to translate that, that's really complicated. Sometimes you can do it, but most of the time you are losing the something, the pun or the meaning or whatever. Usually, when you translate a text, you do use Google and translate and translate a text from the Spanish into English. The, the English version is always shorter. We need more words to explain things, but lots of words. Meaning, I don't know. For example, if you have a thousand words in English, we will need uh, fifteen hundred words to do the same. So that way, we, it, it loses uh, all the effect. Because the shortest the sentence is the, the, the biggest the effect, right? So that's usually what happens. The irony. Irony is very difficult to be translated. And Jane Austen is so ironic that it's also more complicated. But yeah, but anyway, the translations are good enough that millions of Spanish speakers uh, love Jane Austen. So yeah, but it's also, I know some people uh, interested in improving their English in order to read Jane Austen in English. So it's also helpful. Wonderful. One of the most interesting talks we ever had at, at the Jane Austen Society of Australia 
was a professor who, along with his wife, had been translating the novels into German. He was German. And just one of the little examples he gave us, which I thought was really fascinating, came from Emma, when Harriet has the little riddle. So court and ship become yeah. courtship. Right. So that's an English word you can break into two, court and ship, and together they mean courtship. So how on earth does a translator deal with something like that when there is no similar word in their language? Mm. So that was just one of the many examples that he gave us. And it, it really made us think about the, the challenges of you know, putting Jane Austen into a different language. Hi, Miguel. Thank you for that talk. That was really fascinating. You did actually touch on the question that I had, but I wanted to ask about the translation once again, and in particular, what impact the translated versions has had on your understanding of Jane Austen. Do you mainly focus on the English versions or do the Spanish ones help you at all? How does that uh -huh. assist you in your work? Yeah, well, actually, the first book I read it of Jane Austen, Emma, uh, I read it in, in Spanish. Emma, in general, in Spanish. But then once I realized that she was an amazing writer, I decided to read all the books in English, and then I enjoyed it, uh, them more. Uh, one of the things, because I did some research about the Spanish translations, uh, in the early 20th century, the first translation into Spanish of Jane Austen were made from French translations. So the book was translated into French and then from French into Spanish. So you can imagine, right, what would happen. So probably if you lose things in translation, here everything was lost. But at the time, English was not as important in Spain as it is now, right? So the official language would be French. But yeah, I think that the moment you want to translate, when you read a translation, uh, it helps you to go deeper into the language. So when you're contrasting the two versions, then it helps you to so say, okay, so there was a problem here. Why? Why did the, the translator chose this sentence and not this? Uh, because if the translator is good, uh, before doing the translation, this person is going to do a lot of research to understand the context, the language, what the author wants to say. So translation studies also help to understand the original version, to go deeper. Because sometimes when we read, we actually don't pay attention to the text because we are so focused on what we are understanding, the, the feelings of the story. But then you need to stop and to read the actual words. And in Jane Austen, that is very interesting because, as I said, she was very careful and she uh, corrected all the versions so many times that the word that appears is the word, the word that she really wanted. So going through a translation helps to put the focus on the actual words and the construction and the sentences and the parallelisms and all these things. So yeah, I think that it also helps. Hi, Miguel. Um, I'm so excited that you have a Jane Austen Society in Spain. You've opened my world for my learning of Spanish and where I can go and really enjoy two loves of mine, the Spanish language and Jane Austen. So thank you so much for your talk and all the work that you've done. I can't wait to explore what else you've written. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also a very good way to learn Spanish, to read a translation of, of Jane Austen. So, yeah. Mm. Um, then we also have some online book clubs uh, about Jane Austen. So mm -hmm. when you feel confident about your Spanish, you can <laughs> be part of one of our, our book clubs. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Muchas gracias, Maggie. Sí. <laughs> Much, I should have said that. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Well, perhaps you will join with me now in saying a very big thank you to Miguel for what was, I think, a truly fascinating talk. And I know that many people are now really looking forward to reading your excellent book. So thank you so much from all of us well, here thank at you. Jazza. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, an honor. Um, well, if you come to Spain, you know where to find it. So it will be a pleasure to have a face-to-face -face chat about Jan Austin with anyone.
Thank you. And, and Miguel, just to ask finally, Emma was your first Jane Austen novel. Which is yeah. now your favourite? Uh, sorry, my favorite one? Wow, Emma. Emma is my favorite character. Oh, good. I, fine. <laughs> Emma, amazing. I will be Mine like, too. I always said that for me, the perfect woman will be like a mix, uh, like a yeah, mixture of Emma and Elizabeth Bennet. It will be like perfect. amazing. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Miguel. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And adios thank you, thank from you. all of us. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Great that you joined Thanks. us.